Welcome to Happy Planet, where we speak with entrepreneurs, investors, and thought leaders driving the impact economy. I am your host, Abigail Carroll. For a long time, I was best known as Maine's Oyster Lady. Now I work with other mission-driven startups pursuing both profit and planetary health. This work is so exciting and hope-inspiring that I decided to share the stories of some of the incredible people I've met along the way. Our first season will treat the ocean economy, where some of the greatest environmental impacts are being forged from business innovation. We're kicking off our Blue Economy series with an interview with solopreneur Bill Kurtzinger. Bill was a pioneer in deep sea photography in the late 60s and 70s when wetsuits were thin and film limited you to 36 shots per dive. Bill also happened to be my neighbor when I was a young kid in the 70s, and his stories and photos turned me into a young advocate for marine protection. Bill's work is known worldwide. National Geographic's 2003 book, 100 Best Wildlife Photos, includes six of Bill's shots. His seminal work helped open our eyes to the importance of protecting the oceans and its inhabitants. So let's start at the beginning. Bill is a kid from South Jersey. My um, parents moved to Jersey, you know, when I was five or six. And I was raised in actually a farming community on the edge of the New Jersey Pine Barrens and was pretty uh, close to wild places, believe it or not. The Pine Barrens is the largest unbroken forest between Boston and Washington, D.C. You know, as a kid, I, you know, hunted and fished in the Pine Barrens. And, you know, all of a sudden I started to lug a camera around and uh, instead of hunting and fishing. Bill got his first camera before heading off to college in Arizona. I, after my first semester as a sophomore at Northern Arizona, I um, applied to go to Arizona State that had a photo arts program because I was really, really serious. In the process, I was reclassified by my draft board as 1A, and I was off to the Army. And then I you know, managed to squeak into the Navy. And because I had this, and I had this uh, photo arts semester at ASU, I was assigned to a, right out of boot camp, I didn't go to Navy photo school. I was assigned to this special photo unit. in in the Navy called Combat Camera Group, which is actually established during World War II by Edward Steichen, you know, to have photographers, really good photographers cover the war. And I was in this unit and I walked in the door and they had an aviation division, they had an underwater division, they had a, you know, motion picture division. I mean, it was like a, it was like a candy shop to me. And I raised my hand for everything. We sent, we sent, photographers on special assignments all over the world. And one of those places was the Antarctic. As soon as I could, I I went there. I went to Navy dive school first because they had an underwater photo unit. And I was, you know, really interested in that. And when I got out of that, I started doing underwater assignments for the Navy. A lot of it was photographing research and development of, you can, you name it, submarines, torpedoes, underwater mines, you know, Navy, Navy hardware. And then I was sent to the Antarctic and I dove, I first dove under the ice. I was assigned to the National Science Foundation when I went to the Antarctic from the Navy. The Navy logistically supported the National Science Foundation's effort. I was assigned to the National Science Foundation for six months and traveled to the Part of the Antarctic below New Zealand first. Oh, interesting. What year is this? 68. 68. So put us there. What was that like? I was there to photograph science. I, I went out with science teams um, all over the area near McMurdo. You know, I went to meet the principal investigator, Paul Dayton. He was all all gung-ho about me um, you know, being part of their dive team. So I really, my first diving in polar waters with this pioneering group of divers um, who really um, figured out a lot about polar diving. And, you know, I just went out twice a day, went out on the ice and 
the, you know, had these little huts and jumped in the water. And I, I photographed their science and photographed everything around me as best I could. I was in a, uh, of course, it was not a dry suit then. They were wetsuits. And um, it was kind of cold, um, but, you know, it was so exciting to be there in this kind of environment and do and follow these people around and photograph underwater things that really nobody had ever done before. I mean, I never really got cold until I ran out of film and then I got really cold. So <laughs> there was eight feet of ice overhead. So it was serious diving. So eight feet of ice on top of you. And what did you see down there that you didn't expect down in the Southern Oceans? Well, I saw a lot, you know, since I was working with these guys studying the bottom, I mean, there was just, it was such a unbelievable benthic community. Um, sponges, you know, almost as big as I am, very tall, just colorful, benthic sea spiders as big as a dinner plate. There were Weddell seals everywhere. You know, you saw them all the time. They were often in our... we in our dive hole and we would come into the hut, we had these, we would blast a hole in the ice, clear it out and then drag a, a wooden hut on big skids over the hole. It had an oil heater. So um, often when we went down into the hut, there was a seal in the breathing in the, in the hole that we had made. Enjoying the warmth. Well, just breathing, just using it as a, you know, place to breathe. <laughs> Can you tell me a little bit what it was like to manage proper film, a roll of 36 shots. You just had to make sure you waited for, you know, the right moment to to take the photograph. You only had, you didn't have that many chances. So I love this idea that the limit of the film basically kept you from freezing. Yeah. If I had a digital camera, I'd probably be dead. <laughs> what I wouldn't have given for a digital camera underwater in my day. So. How do you think that digital technology has changed the that industry? Oh, everything's changed it completely. You know, um, I love it. You know, I, I wish I, I would give anything for a digital camera underwater in my day. My whole career was film. And um, the idea of having, you know, a digital system underwater with, you know, un, basically unlimited, depending on the, the card you use, uh, unlimited exposures is just, you know, crazy. <laughs> so, okay, you're, you're in the Navy. When did you realize that you could make a career out of this? You know, I, I had an amazing career in the Navy and I did amazing things, constantly gone, constantly traveling on these temporary assignments. But I just knew I wasn't going to stay in the Navy. It just wasn't my thing. So before I got out of the Navy, I went to see um, a retired admiral who had been in the um, Antarctic during in the 50s. Um, he ran the program. He was a brilliant man. He retired to um, a job at the Naval um, a Maritime Museum in Newport News, which is just about a half hour away from where I was stationed in Norfolk, Virginia. And I called him up and I said, I'd like to come talk to you. And... Um, went to talk to him and showed him my work. And he says to me, well, what can I do for you? And I said, I want to work. I want to work for the geographic. And in front of me, he picked the phone up and called the president of the National Geographic Society, wow. Gilbert Grosvenor, who he had, he was friends with and had his Rolodex. And he said right in front of me, Gilbert, I've got this young Navy photographer here. I'd like, I think you should see his work. That's how I got into the geographic. So a couple of weeks later, I ended up at the Geographic, you know, still in the Navy. Um, and I already spent time in the Antarctic Peninsula. And to me, the peninsula was the most interesting and the most biologically diverse, for sure. I just had this idea about a National Geographic Antarctic Peninsula story. So this Admiral George Dufek called up the Geographic, got me an interview. And a couple of weeks later, I walked in the door at the geographic and went up to the president's office and he picked the phone up. He called Robert Gilka, who was the um, director of photography and said, Bob, I've got this young Navy photographer here and I'd like to see his work. So I went down to the fourth floor to see Mr. Gilka 
as I walked uh, into his office, he had a sign on the door that said, wipe your knees before entering. That was sort of the tenor of our interview. He was very gruff, you know, looked at my work, sort of. And I had talked up, I showed him a lot of the Antarctic stuff. And I talked up this idea and he didn't say anything at the time. And he hardly looked at anything. He says, well, I got to go. I got a, I got a meeting. I got up and I'm already out the door. And he says, hey, and I turned back into the door and he said, send me that proposal on the Antarctic Peninsula. And that's all I left with. So, Bill, what year are we when you're, you're getting this first proposal through to National Geographic? It was 1970 when I proposed this idea to the Geographic. And I sent it in and I didn't hear back for months. And um, I actually then I got a three month cut from the Navy because the Navy was getting rid of people. And I was actually home and I got a phone call from a big cheese at the geographic and said, we've reviewed your proposal. We'd like you to come to Washington and we want to send you on your way to the Antarctic Peninsula. Well, first of all, it seems like you're looking at the ocean when everybody's thinking about the moon, right? Like this is this is like putting this in context. It's like everybody in the world is obsessed with outer space and you're opening this window to something that people have largely ignored, which is deep sea life, the ecology of the ocean. Well, you're right about the um, attention that space gets, for example, compared to the marine world. I mean, we know very little about the marine world, really, if you consider the vastness of of oceans and the deepness of oceans and all the organisms that make up that system. Um, we, we don't really know anything. We, we know a lot, but we know, there's a lot we don't know. And, you know, there's an, uh, the same attention given to underwater exploration, say, say I mean, scientific exploration, then there is a space, you know, there's no NASA version of underwater <laughs> federal agency, um, you know, looking looking at the ocean other than, you know, I guess NOAA could, could be the equivalent. But I don't know. There isn't that uh, attention given to underwater science as, as there is to other things. But anyway, there's, um, you know, we know so little about it. It's so vast and so complicated and the systems and, you know, we're, we're starting to learn a lot more right now with how we've wrecked things. Were we worried about plastic in the ocean back then, or is that a new concern? I think there have been a lot of more gas dumps by big tankers since then, or oil dumps. What were, like, when you were diving in, in Antarctica, which is a very fertile ground for phytoplankton and krill and ocean churning, what were some of the environmental things that were most compelling to you and that you felt were most important? Believe it or not, I remember even when I was in the Antarctic very early, scientific papers on plastics in the Antarctic, plastic particles that would be in the air column that would end up in the on the on the continent on the polar plateau which was crazy to think about but it was happening even back then and now of course it's a lot worse i was you know my my i'm i'm not a, a scientist i'm not a biologist um i don't have any formal training in science but what i was what i realized as i started on this journey a lot of the animals and the and the 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 marine environments that interested me the most were the less viewed and that people knew less about. I was not interested at all in photographing pretty fish on a coral reef. I was drawn to the more um, secretive places like the Antarctic, like actually the temperate waters off Maine, um, and not, I really wasn't interested in tropical things. Um, the, the, Polar and temperate seas, temperate seas interested me the most. And I was, um, I sort of became, once I started on this marine mammal thing, I really realized that nobody really had photographed a lot of marine mammals at all. <laughs> and I was just, you know, I was obsessed with bringing those animals into into the light, basically. And, and my, my, 
I guess my main mission was to photographing these animals in a way people would take a look and maybe get interested in helping, you know, save them. You know, there were still whale hunts all around the world when I started photographing whales, but there still are a few. But, you know, I think the attention given to to whales and other marine mammals by organizations like the one you belong to um, really, really turn, turn the tide on whale hunting. And, the, you know, the Marine Mammal Act was part in the U.S. Um, I think, I can't remember, I guess in the late 70s, you can't kill marine mammals anymore. You can't do anything. You can't even possess a, a, a bone or anything from a marine mammal. And those are all good, good, good things. So, you know, the world started to become uh, aware of uh, these these animals are in trouble and they're not going to, you know, if we don't do something about it, uh, they're not going to be around. And I think we did something about it. And I think my work may have had a tiny molecule of help along that. I think it, I think it absolutely did. I mean, you were a true pioneer. Nobody had photographed some of these mammals that you had photographed. So this is, you know, I just want the viewers to understand how how really seismic this was in terms of a you know sort of shift in the way we were thinking and the way we were discovering these these beautiful beautiful animals. We'll be right back after a short break. For a blue economy to thrive, people need to use more sustainable products. But which products? And will consumers actually adopt them? Innovators like you are hustling to figure this out. Spark number nine can tell you if there's demand for your product. Spark markets your product before it's built using online advertising so you launch smarter. Have a big idea? Vet it with Spark before you build. Visit Spark online at www.sparkno9.com or find them on LinkedIn. Welcome back to Happy Planet. Let's return to my conversation with Bill Kurtzinger. So most of this podcast is really about classic startups and innovation that have a planetary benefit. You were an entrepreneur. You were being an artist, is being an entrepreneur. And that first trip that you took that seemed to be so seminal and and sort of path changing for you really is about how to how to think of something differently and and explore a new area and an event in a way that's new and and groundbreaking that nobody's ever done before and then there was another story i read about about the narwhal that i think is a you know really exemplifies another really important lesson in entrepreneurship which is persistence and and just going the extra mile to 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 get your to your goal well, the Norwal story is pretty typical of my my whole career. I didn't have the benefit of talking to somebody who had already done this before. You know, a lot of the work and the animals I photographed had really never been photographed. And I was kind of unknown territory. And the Narwhal is just one example of the fact that, you know, I just didn't let little temporary problems get in my way. I was going to go do narwhals for this whale story, and I sort of let myself be talked into joining this team. Got to the Arctic and got camped on this island, and I realized that wasn't really their mission. They were they were there to do something else, a film on whatever. So, you know, I just decided to... Oh, okay, I'm just going to get in the water. And I just swam off all by myself from shore. You know, I just kept swimming, you know, many, many meters offshore. And, you know, one morning when I did this, sure enough, I could hear them coming. They were vocalizing with their, between, each, between themselves. And, and all of a sudden, there they were all around me. And I just was able to get these, the first photographs underwater of Narwhal. That effort is pretty typical of all my assignments. You know, the the effort it takes to, to get to a place in these animals' lives where you can, you know, extract a publishable image for the National Geographic is is everything. You know, and in the, in the, sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll spend a month 
getting in m- myself in a situation where I can see and photograph something and I spend five minutes and it's over, it's done. And that's, that was the nature of my work. So you said something that was just really caught my attention just now, you know, you're the first guy who shot a narwhal, but that also means the narwhals hadn't really had much human interaction. So how did these great animals react to you coming in among them and and photographing them? Well, that's that's a great question. And that's um, and I know in my career. And many of these situations and many of the animals that I photographed, I, I was the very first member of the human race I had ever seen. And I've never felt threatened by any marine mammal ever, really. I've never been harmed by one or it's just it's just pretty amazing. They're, they're incredibly aware of you. You know, dolphins, for example, know you're there long before I would see them. You know, they're, they're using their sonar to figure out what's, what's in their world around them. And they, they, literally can see light into your, into your organs. <laughs> and um, they know you're there long before I can, I know they're there. So they come towards you and, you know, they're echolocating you, which is like looking at you with their sonar, not with their eyes. They're looking at you with this echolocation and in their brains, they're, have this visual image of who you are in a way that we, we don't see things. And, you know, oftentimes they're curious, very curious. And they often come right up to you. Some are shyer than others and some hang around. Some just come by for a quick little hello and you don't see them again, but you know, you have to um, be ready for those moments. And, you know, I, I am very comfortable with the word curiosity when it comes to, describing marine mammal behavior vis-a-vis me. They're often incredibly curious. I mean, I, 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 there's no doubt in my mind about how intelligent these animals are. I can say they are. I know they are. I feel it. I've lived it. Um, you know, a scientist needs to have more sort of, you know, data uh, to say something like that. But there's no doubt in my mind they're incredibly intelligent. They, you know, dolphin have these complex social groups they live in and, you know, they swim in these large groups and they have to, you know, they have to be, they're, they're attentive to their own social needs. You know, you're swimming with your grandmothers and your aunts and uncles and these big groups, literally. And there's people, there's predators after them all the time. Plus they have to feed themselves. So it's, it's a very interesting world and they've figured it out. So you, you mentioned sort of with the narwhals and then just the sort of sonar sensories of the, of the dolphins, the sound. <laughs> so it's funny because we don't think of sound so much as part of the underwater environment. But can you, can you speak to that a little bit and tell me some of the interesting things you've heard underwater? Well, you know, when I was a kid, one, I think one of the reasons I ended up like this is I read Cousteau's book in the 50s, late 50s, called Silent World. And it didn't take me long to realize that the ocean is anything but silent. It's um, sound travels faster and farther underwater. And it's just um, you can hear things underwater that you can't, you can't believe. You know, even as a tourist off Maui in Hawaii, you can hear humpback whales miles away, literally. And the the sound is, it's a carcaphony of of noises. Marine mammals are communicating with each other all the time with sound and other, other things. Even on a coral reef, there's all this, all these animals making sounds and using sounds to find things. And um, it's just not a silent world at all, like Cousteau the title of his book, you know, when you do immerse yourself underwater, there's a moment, and I think every diver has this sense, there's a moment when you 
you're just suddenly cut off from the whole world above you. And that that you're cut off from the sound of the world above you, but it's like there's something there's something meditative about it, being in the water and you're literally in another you're in another place, another medium, in another world that's completely cut off from your normal world above. You know, and you you're only a temporary visitor. You can't stay there like all the other creatures that you're trying to photograph, but there's there's this incredible attraction for me just to that. Just just immersing myself in my head underwater. It's like everything else goes away. All the troubles above gone. This is beautiful. Tell me a little bit about, you know, you mentioned the the whales could sense you from far away and how far can you see underwater? Like what is the like what these in these really sort of pristine areas like the Antarctic and the Arctic? Well, the Antarctic, like in October in the Southern Ocean, that's early spring there. You have to realize that the the photo period has been shut down for six months because the sun has been in the Northern Hemisphere and the phytoplankton production has, has been nil. So the water in the Antarctic under that ice is literally gin clear. I have measured, I have personally measured a thousand feet of lateral visibility underwater. Now, if you stay in that same place until February and the water is so thick with plankton because the sun's up 24 hours a day. I have this sort of image now of your, this sort of idyllic, meditative, beautiful world under the water, but you have had some as as most entrepreneurs, there have been a few uh, scary moments. Of course, um, I know there was uh, a close encounter with a shark. Do you want to tell us about that? I um, only talk about that late night in bars with young women. Um, no, no, I'm joking. Of course, um, I know, I know. I was with this intrepid sailor who written a book um, about Polynesian navigation and chronicled these, um, you know, Carolinian sailors who sailed all over the place. They knew exactly, they know exactly where they were. They don't have a compass. They just use the stars, the birds, the water. They just, you know, knew where they were all the time and sailing long distances between these islands. His name was David Lewis um, and he was a really interesting guy, and he was the writer of this uh, Polynesian seafaring article. And we were in the Caroline Islands, where he had been before. And I was on a we had chartered a sailboat. We were following these Carolinian canoes around the, that part of Micronesia, and we went into this lagoon overnight to anchor. Well, you know, it was a late afternoon. Uh, I was, you know, it was always hot, you know, and I, it wasn't an underwater assignment. So, you know, I'm in this amazing place and I was always jumping in the water because that's what I, who I am. And I jumped in the water and, you know, uh, swimming, snorkeling around. And all of a sudden I, I dove down to the bottom of this lagoon. And so on my way back up and sort of turning around and I got halfway around and I saw this blur coming at my head and I only had time to put my hand up and he shark bit my hand and I got up to the surface of course and um, started to yell and scream as loud as I could and while I was swimming um, on my back for some reason I turned on my back I don't know why I think you know your ventral side is the most vulnerable with all your you know right but I think I didn't even think about it and I just right. didn't it's I was instinctive just, but every time I dip my left hand in the water, there's a big cloud of blood. And I could see this shark again coming after me. Oh. <laughs> um, and he, he must have gone on under me and around me. And he came behind me and raked my shoulder with his teeth. He didn't bite me. He wasn't, he wasn't trying to eat me. This is a gray reef shark. They're very territorial and kind of have a terrible reputation in, in that part of the world. I don't know. I was just desperately swimming as fast as I could 
to get back to the boat. And in the meantime, somebody had jumped in a little skiff and was coming after me. So I, there wasn't a moment, it's funny, it wasn't a moment where I was climbing into the, this little skiff. I flew into it. <laughs> I, I wasn't trying to climb in. I just flew into the boat. And, you know, I had this little, little movie, little film in my head about my whole life. I remember as I was doing this swim thinking, well, this is it, Bill. And I remember thinking about my dog as a kid, wow. my girlfriend at the time. I, was, I remember saying, thinking of Mr. Gilka. He's going to be so disappointed I'm not able to finish this assignment. <laughs> so all this, these things were in my head as I was, you know, and that, that people talk about this movie and, you know, it really, it's real. It happens. I, I had it. Wow. But anyway, I got on the boat and we were able to finally, after many attempts, get to, uh, well, we tried to get to, you know, I got a, we turned a mail boat around to pick me up at this island and got to, I can't remember, Saipan. And then finally flew to Guam to a Navy hospital. But by the time I got to a, an antiseptic facility, there was nothing they could do because it all, my hand and my shoulder it all just crushed it over. You know, it was really, all right. the tissue was really hard. And so I had to do, I had to undergo what was called a secondary closure, but I had to wait to do that because I had to soak my hand and my shoulder uh, for a couple of weeks. Um, anyway, I, as it happens, a geographic, the editor of the magazine was on his way back from Australia or somewhere, and he he came and picked me up and took me back to D.C. and they set me up as his hand surgeon, and and that's that's what happened. So, wow, amazing! I know, it's pretty queer, pretty crazy. Well, I'm glad you, I'm glad you're here to tell the tale. <laughs> uh, although I know sharks get kind of a bum rap. Yeah, they do. So. Is there anything about being underwater that really surprised you? Like what's the sort of most surprising or unusual thing that you ever did or saw? You know, my whole career was unusual. <laughs> my whole career was surprising. And, you know, I, I was lucky to be in this situation where I was allowed to go and photograph things that nobody had ever seen. Everything I did was new and unbelievably exciting. I do want to hear more about The Wake of the Whale. I remember it coming out, and I just remember it being really, really exciting. And the images in that book are ingrained in my head, from the leopard seal to the, the cover of, the, of that um, with the humpback whale. Those were really impactful images of my youth. What, what, do you, what year did you publish that book? 80 or 81. There was nothing like it in America. I mean, in Europe, there were big photo books like that, but there weren't big books on nature until David Brower and his the people he worked with brought, brought them to the American public. And he got a lot of pushback from it because a lot of, um, you know, bookstores and publishers said, well, there's no room on a bookshelf for a book that big. But, you know, he just pressed on and you know, his legacy is incredible in the publishing world. In my mind, he, he did those books, and they were they were so important to a lot of people, and you know, surely to me. So, and then you know, Wake of the Whale came out, and that was my first book, and never looked back. You've been out of the industry for a while, but there's there's a there's an interest from not just me, but other people around you in in taking another look at this work today. So, what's what's going on? My last story in the Geographic was on harbor porpoises in the Gulf of Maine, which is something I wanted to do for a long time. And that was in June of 2003. So, you know, I was, I was ready to do something else. In 2004, I got this phone call from an Italian publisher who had knew my, he, he knew my work from the Geographic because he published National Geographic books in, in Italian. This guy calls me up and he says, um, Bill, I'd like to publish a book, of, a retrospective of your work in uh, nine languages in 11 countries. And it was like, ha, 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 ha. Right. That's what they all say. Well, turns out that's exactly what he did. And this book was uh, the book Extreme Nature. It was published in 05. When I was on this book tour 
I can't tell you how many people with a copy of Wake of the Whale said to me, words like, um, I'm a marine biologist because of this book. I mean, I, I don't know, several people come bring it for me to sign their Wake of the Whale. How many years later? Um, so I don't know. You can't, you can't really ask for more than that. Um, that, that, that right there is about as rewarding a thing that any photographer or anybody in my business could ever ask for. Bill's solopreneur career as an ocean photographer changed the world of photography forever. He set a whole new standard for risk and return, but his greatest impact may have been elsewhere. By revealing the beauty of marine mammals to the general public, he opened our eyes and our hearts to the importance of protecting the ocean and its inhabitants. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast and for your contribution to the planet. To learn more about Bill and see his photographs and prints, please visit his website, BillKurtzinger.com. You can find his link in our show notes. Thank you for listening. Please follow the Happy Planet podcast wherever you listen and leave us a rating and review. It really does help new listeners discover the show. Happy Planet was reported and hosted by me, Abigail Carroll. I am the executive producer. The talented Dylan Hoyer is our producer and editor. Our theme music was created by composer George Brandel Egloff. Learn more about my work and get in touch by visiting happyplanetcapital.com.